Fees and uh, our continuing conversation on the Constitution of American Life. Uh, students and teachers, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, political parties with a very good friend of ours. Uh, and this is the second our session that we've had with uh, Professor Henry Chambers. He goes by Hanks. He is a graduate of the University of Virginia, currently teaches at the University of Richmond uh, Law School. I first met him. He was at the University of Missouri, Columbia, a fascinating community. Uh, and I'm sure he was very sad to leave for the great state of uh, Virginia uh, there. Uh, he has a quite a portfolio, uh, but most importantly, he's an excellent teacher and he's a great supporter of civic education, uh, having been involved in some capacity with We the People for a very long time. So as we said tonight, we're going to talk about political uh, parties uh, there. And my first question to you, uh, Hank, and, and to all of you, and it's, a, it's kind of a simple one, basic one. Are political parties natural? That is, there's, because there's a lot of conversation. I read a lot, of, I Googled it today. The, the number of articles and things on people wanting to somehow get rid of parties or, you know, or, or restrict them in such a way that, you know, that uh, to me are unreasonable. And I, I wanna yell at them and say, you, there's just no way to do that. Uh, that they are they are natural and they are inevitable. Would, would you agree with that? Yes, to the extent that people have political affinities. So to the extent that they have political affinities or they think they have political affinities, that likely will then develop into political parties. Now, the number of political parties, that's a different story. If we had a parliamentary system, then that'd be different. But we're a first past the post kind of place. So as a consequence, it's the two party system that's the issue, which gets so much to the core of question two in terms of there's nothing I dread so much as a division of the republic into two great parties, right? That's a little bit different. But I'll, I'll stop there because my, my, my brothers have things to say. Well, Jeff, Chris, our, our, Mike. Our, are Go. parties are parties factions? No. Okay. Because well, they're inevitable. I'm like like Madison. You know, and factions being inevitable, right? That air to fire is liberty is the faction thing. So, and, and I am curious to hear from the rest of you because you know, obvi and that was from gosh, year one, 1986. I was at the initial training at UCLA uh, on this this program that was developed. Uh, you know, uh, that becomes we the people and. That was one of the first questions our, it, that Margaret Branson, you know, uh, threw at me, a part, our party's factions. And, well, the definition of, of, a, of a faction is a group, large or small, the way I understand it, with kind of a singular interest. And parties don't have that singular interest. They're composite of, of many factions. Uh, well, I, I, I would agree at one point, David, that I think there are factions within parties, right? I think that's why I, I would always coach that or you know, coach that up with my students that parties themselves are not factions there are factions within parties but now with the ideological purity that certain groups are somewhat demanding of members um i don't know i, th I think that perhaps certain parties are taking on that definition of madison from fed 10 because uh, i like to think there used to be you know you know Roosevelt Republicans or whatever, whatever, you know, throw out all the different factions that we know throughout history that would fit within the two main parties, Blue Dog Democrats, Log Cabin Republicans, you know, things like that. Um, but I think that uh, we're tending to, you know, the idea of being a rhino. So I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if, if I can honestly say that parties aren't factions right now. I'd say the founders would find the question kind of uh, odd because they think they use the terms more interchangeably than what we might. Uh, and again, I have, I, I can't resist to get a cheap shot in on the political scientist uh, nature of this question, whether factions or parties or not. Um, I mean, uh, but I, I think Hank, Hank brings up an interesting point about the first past the post nature of our society. And I would, uh, if indeed that's a valid point, it, I would say, and I would say it is, but I'd also root it in the fact that we had a very binary origins of our political parties. I mean, the first, I've been reading a fair amount lately on the first Continental Congress, 
and the binary nature of their agenda was <laughs> do we stay or do we go now that's a really stark choice uh, and I think in many ways, we either have the revolution to blame for the first part past the post nature of the way we think about political parties because of the revolution had such stark options. I mean, that certainly carries through into the Second Continental Congress. Uh, it certainly carries through in the Federalist, Anti-Federalist debate. So I think Hank's point's well taken that uh, we are a first past the post kind of place. And I think the origins of our country, for better or worse, is a major reason why we have that. Well, I think the design, I mean, that's the Electoral College design. It creates that first pass of the post, right? And, you know, I've mentioned Duverger's yeah. law in here a couple of times that whenever you have that first pass of the post, inevitably you only have two parties. And Tim, I love the fact that you worked in the clash reference there. <laughs> Professor Sorry. Williams. Yeah, well, to your question, I think if, if you were going to have... <laughs> Uh, if, if there's going to be a democracy where some segment of your population is going to be voting for represent, representation, then yeah, I think political parties are going to emerge. Um, I mean, political parties, Tim, from the political science point of view, um, <laughs> which you which you may or may not agree with when you go down to, uh, what is the pit you go to, the tavern? It's the tavern? You go to the tavern, right? The Lincoln Tap, the Lincoln Tap. Classy, classy place. You see, with the tap, when you go down the tap, people, parties are necessary because they need to recruit people to run for office. They need to get voters to know who they could be voting for, right? And that's what makes them different than I think factions or interest groups. Um, I think at the time of the founding, I was doing a little history today. I'm not a, I'm not a historian about um, political parties at all, but I was thinking, what were the models the founders had? And all they really had was what was going on in Britain. And in Britain, they did not, I mean, the Whigs, I would argue, are not a political party. They are like, it's an individualized sort of patronage networks of nobles, right, getting into power. So they didn't really have a model. Um, but I think as soon as you start to open up for voting, you're going to, you are going to um, lose your power if you can't get people to get your people into the Congress. So it's a necessity to, to come up with some sort of platform or, or umbrella to get people together. And so I think parties are kind of inevitable in a democracy. Well, so the, the first parties, and obviously we're talking 1789, 1991, are they ideological? Is, is the primary, you know, uh, motive of their formation? Is it ideological or is it cultural? And to what extent today are parties ideological and cultural? And is there even a distinction between uh, those two things? Uh, Hank? I, I, I think that, that that's a hard one. I would, I think the answer is that they're ideological, but of course, they they definitely look ideological in retrospect. Right. So, so, so once they collapse, we look back and say, hmm, what made for those parties? And we go, well, it was this, it was this, it was this. And, and they feel ideological. Do, do I think that, the, that those parties were really all that different? I'm not sure. To the extent that they came out of, say, a, a Federalist and Anti-Federalist structure, it's easy to say, well, obviously, the Federalists came out of a Federalist structure. The Anti-Federalists or, or the, the Jeffersonian Republicans, Democrat Republicans came out of the anti-federalist structure. Yes, those movements were ideological, therefore the parties were. But do I think the parties were truly all that separate? I'm, I'm not sure. That is, to the extent that we also have elites, I'm not sure that they were all that far apart, except in their own area. Right. That, that is, when they were talking about those elite things, yes, it seemed as though it was blood sport, but I'm not sure that it was blood sport versus the average person on the street uh, who they didn't really care all that much about. There's a, a fair ago, and her thesis is essentially um, that the the formation of parties in the 90s had little to do with ideology. It had everything to do with uh, 
in a way, personality. Who who were you going to align with in Congress? And so, and the book uh, the book is called the uh, Affairs of Honor. So it was uh, her argument is it's not uh, although Federalist anti Federalist overlay is a part of it to Hank's point. Uh, she argues that they're really adrift and they don't want to be British. Uh, so they're stuck with kind of looking at who the big dogs are and forming alliances based upon that. Uh, now, I think that's, a, that's an argument that's, um, that's an argument that deserves a, some pushback on it because I think there are some ideological principles here. Uh, uh, but the fluidity of Madison too, I think is an interesting counter to the question of, is it ideological? Because many people see him as fluctuating back and forth on political issues uh, when he gets to the 90s. So uh, I think, you know, I suppose the short answer is, yeah, a little bit of ideology and a little bit uh, personality, according to Freeman. Well, today it seems that so much, today, again, my read is so much of our party alignment. And it's interesting, you know, about the faction question, you know, it is quite possible, Chris, that the Republican Party is a faction, because to me, they're going through a purge what you called rhinos, but they seem to be purging certain elements and they're trying to create this one singular uh, focus. And maybe it's all about personality, but it seems to me to be far more cultural. Today, we talk about red states, blue states uh, in that sense. Was that true, Tim, uh, in the 70s? And you say it's personality, but what to, 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 what, to what degree? Well, I, I don't say it's personality, Joanne Freeman does, but- okay. Um, uh, but what, to what degree was there the, the, these cultural uh, factors uh, uh, in the 1790s? Well, sure. Uh, Northern Federal, yeah, exactly. Northern Federalists are different than Southern Federalists. Northern Anti-Federalists are different. Addison kind of was looking at that uh, when he, when he uh, in Fed 10, made the argument that all these factions would be uh, self-neutralizing. So I think there's a geographic overlay at the founding that we, that we underestimate. Let me just add one one point uh, in terms of Joanne Freeman. Of course, Joanne Freeman did a lot of good work uh, with respect to affairs of honor that helped turn into some of the stuff that popped up in Hamilton. So that's just another reason to read Joanne Freeman. Uh, so I've heard this said a lot. Uh, in fact, it was uh, it was my professor in uh, undergrad uh, who. I took an undergrad con law class. And, uh, you know, when we got into some policy issues, his argument was the policies generally have not changed for 200 years. That if we look at the divisions of, of Jefferson and Hamilton, those divisions are still here. The fact pattern, you know, those things, yeah, those are different, but the, the main fundamental issues are, are, are have remained constant throughout our history that, lead to these or, or affirm these two parties. Do you guys agree with that? Well, well first I gotta ask, had 200 years actually passed when you were in college? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> good, good, good point there, uh, <laughs> Professor Chambers. Uh, no, it I'm had fired. <laughs> I, 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 I will just say, just just very briefly, it is hard to imagine what that professor meant to the extent that the Civil War came and went. I I I I just have no idea what what he meant. Um, but I'll I'll leave, I'll leave it to others to to or 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 actually, David, you 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 can suggest what he meant when he when when he said things haven't changed with the parties in in two hundred years. Well, we obviously, and again, this is a, a big topic, you know, obviously the institution of slavery is at the core of that conflict, but peripheral to that is federal state relations. And federal state relations is one of the very first factors that lead to the formation of our parties. And federal state relations, one could argue, is still at the core of what my, what what we might argue are are the formation of our or the continuation of our our parties today. So the Civil War did it 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 did you know address some elements of that federal state relationship, uh, but it it sure didn't solve it uh, in many ways. So that's and again that actually came up in that conversation 
that we had in class about the Civil War, didn't that radically shift those questions? And his response was no. Uh, the federal state uh, question still lives on. Yes, with different facts, different situations, but it's still at the core of our two-party system. Yeah, now that, that's a fascinating question in terms of when, when I think of, of Tim's point about Northern Federalist, Southern Federalist, Northern Anti-Federalist, Southern Anti-Federalist. And then when you think about, say, the election of 1860, where you really had folks who were splintered. And, and then when you think about how the Democratic Party in the 1830s with the Southern Democrats and the Northern Democrats, I, I'm not really sure that it was all about, I'm not sure that any party necessarily viewed the state versus federal question in the same ways that the Federalists and Anti-Federalists viewed it in the late 1700s, assuming that we believe that the Federalists and Anti-Federalists actually believed differently when it came to state power and federal power. Um, it's a, I think it's a fascinating question to think about. And what's unfortunate is for the students of today, what they haven't seen or what they did not see was the realignment of the Southern Democratic Party into the Southern Republican Party. Because I suspect to them, this sounds completely foreign, right? The, the exactly. idea of state versus federal just completely sounds foreign in terms of what the Democratic Party and the Republican Party really stand for today. But I think it's a fascinating issue. But I'll, 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 leave, I'll leave it at that because I want to hear what, uh, what, what, what my brothers have to say. I would students check out Lee Atwater and the Southern Strategy. Just just Google that and see what you can find out in terms of that realignment and see what that goes. I just I I'm, I'm sorry I you, I was thinking I had a student say something that was just brilliant the other day in class. I mean I really was. It's like I had to I tried to narrow them down on something. Okay, so pick the one thing that was the tipping point that led to the Civil War. Right? What's the one thing? All this stuff, you know, all this craziness. And this, this kid said, uh, yeah, it was the Lincoln-Douglas debates. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, when Lincoln gets Douglas to say they, they have to come up with a Freeport doctrine, because now he's a Northern Democrat who's just alienated the Southern Democrats, and he will not win the presidency in 1860. And they, they that splinters that... Well, that Michael... Uh well, I, I think it's our, our evening to give a shout out to the University of Virginia. So um, having said that, Michael Holt, uh, I, I guess uh, I knew, David, you knew this was coming. Um, you know, it could, it'd be interesting for students to look into why a major party collapsed. And Michael Holt uh, kind of takes this idea of let's look at the Whig Party. How did it collapse? And his subthesis is that's the reason. That's the reason the Civil War occurred because Southern Whigs uh, abandoned the Whig Party. Uh, you know, the Whig was a national party, and so you can't have a whole section of the country abandon the party and it still be a viable national uh, national party. So I might urge students to think about uh, not only how factions coalesce, but also how uh, how a major party can make miscalculations. Uh, and and fall apart. Now, I think that actually students might, that might resonate with students now because I think they may they may be astute enough to to look at right now and say, is the Republican Party collapsing? And if indeed it is, why is it collapsing? So it it might be interesting for students to think about the collapse of the Whig Party um, in in tandem with what's uh, what's the uh, dilemma that the Republican Party is facing right now. And, and then go study the reign of terror in the French Revolution. I'm just, I just, well, I, you know, I was <laughs> thinking about the uh, the devouring nature of uh, the inter intra fighting uh, within the perhaps the GOP right now, and I'm that reign of terror comes to mind. I don't know why that is. I don't know. Well, I mean, if we get if if we get to the core of the question, the issues, and and again. Correct me if I'm wrong, as it's, we've made it clear I'm wrong quite often. The, the, the key issues of the 1790s are, are predominantly commercial, the Bank of the United States, uh, somewhat visionary, what kind of 
of, of nation are we going to be? Are we going to be agrarian, you know, small farmer, virtuous community government closest to the people or Hamilton's vision of, you know, of, a, of maybe a more industrial base and, and foreign policy. Those, those, as I understand it, are kind of the three key issues of the 1790s. And to some degree, aren't those the same issues today? Uh, if we look at, at what, it, what explains the rise of Trump and this, this resentment developing in the Midwest and Southern states uh, about the changing nature of the economy uh, and about the fat power of the federal government and economic decision making. And even Trump, I think, brought up, you know, or weakened that, that foreign policy consensus that a lot of people, you know, talked about for the post-World War II period. And we are, we are definitely seeing a greater division in the views of foreign policy. So you know, what about, it? again, that's reaffirming what I said earlier, that does seem like the issues are generally uh, the same, you know, given the vast changes, obviously, in, in the nature of society. So, so let me, let me, uh, let me ask you this. What do you do with a Jefferson in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, which do doesn't strike me as being a terribly anti-federalist kind of move? Now, maybe Jefferson's no, the wrong kind of well, cat. No, but I think, Hank, what, how I would respond to that, well, sure, that's a great uh, national government policy, but it creates a, um, an environment where the small scale uh, uh, self-sustaining farmer, the localism uh, that the anti-federalists emphasized heavily. Well, so well, cer certainly, uh, yeah, so that, that's how I would respond to that. It's a policy that does create the space for the localism that anti-federalists had longed for and said uh, the federalists were opposed to. Yeah, yeah, but, but Jefferson was no small local farmer. He talked a good game, but that's not what he did. Right. right? So, so, so that's well, why I, 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 he's the wrong kind of guy to, 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 to mention because he was such a, sure. you know, he, because he, 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 he always talked a good game. Right. He, and, but, sure. but, but, but it does sort of raise a question. For, and, and, and the 1803 is in addition to, of course, the Northwest Territories. So, so it also does raise the question in terms of when we ask what kind of nation do we want to be, we can also ask, whoa, were the Anti-Federalists looking for a nation or were they looking for something different? Because Correct. You know, there's so many different fault lines that I'm not sure that we can can carry them all through to today. That's kind of what I mean when I say, well, okay, if we want to find a right. fault line, what we're going to do is we're going to look backward and try to find one. But I'm not sure that they were there at right. the time. But I could be wrong well, about that. I mean, there was a there were a lot of op there's a lot of New England opposition to Louisiana. Uh, I mean, the debates in Congress, I mean, they were livid uh, uh, for several reasons. One, they, they argued the Constitution. Now, uh, uh, led the way on this, uh, claiming that perpetuating this, the, you know, the small scale uh, self, uh, self-sustaining uh, would be isolationist and uh, ran directly counter to kind of the commercial uh, vision that Hamilton and others had. So th there was tremendous blowback in Congress on the Louisiana Purchase. Tim, did you right. give a name of someone that led the way? Did you say something? Fisher I'm Ames. Okay, because okay, you had cut out there a little bit. Yeah, uh, there, there were other, but a lot of Connecticut and Massachusetts opposition. Professor Williams, you looked like you were gonna chime in. Well, yeah, I just, I think I think you could construct an argument that the issues have remained the same, but I don't think it's the best argument. Um, it, one question, just as empirically, is like, how do we know? Where are we looking to know what those issues are? Is it what people cared about, or what the political parties said they cared about? So empirically, we'd have to think about that. But then, secondly, you know, at, in the 1790s, we did not have a robust middle class. We, the debate to me maybe was about state elites and federal elites 
and how they wanted the system to be sort of configured to benefit them. And I think today the issues that political parties have to deal with are with this middle class and, and kind of what their desires are. And with the socioeconomic development that we've had the last 200 years, we know from the political science research that people's values and what they ask government to do change. So I don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's the same issues. I think, um, I think political parties today have to think about different issues than they did in the 1790s. Such as, give me yeah. something. I'll give you one. And, and I read this today, getting ready for the courts discussion we just had. You know the number one issue that was important to Republican voters in 2016? The Supreme uh, Court. The Supreme huh? Court. The Supreme Court. No. Yep. Yep. And there's no way that anyone in the 17, like political parties weren't thinking about the Supreme Court. If you ask voters today, like in, in this last election, what are the Republican platform? What were they running on? Turn back health care, turn back gay rights, and overturn Roe v. Wade, right? These, I mean, our political culture and the issues that government deals with, I think, are so different than they were 230 years ago. I mean, I could construct the argument that it's all around federalism. I could do that, but I, I just don't think it's the strongest argument. I think there's a lot more going on. But is it, if, if that is indeed true, that, that the number one issue was the court, it's the court because of the, the single issue element of the Republican Party. And, and that, is, that is the abortion issue, right? And, and so really it's, it was more about, it, it was more about you know, so-called human rights issues and, okay, than, then, than the institution. Which party was it? The Federals or Anti-Federalists that were pro-individual rights? I forget. Well, <laughs> I mean, if we're saying the issue persist, I mean, like, well, they, they they both they both picked up that label as they just had different frameworks of how those things would be enhanced. Right. I mean, but like, I mean, who was for the right to privacy? Like, which which party was stronger in terms of whether there was a right to privacy? Oh, oh, stop. Stop. Well, well, <laughs> stop. Yeah. well thank but, you, but, Professor but Moore. Is, well, but Mike raises a great issue because in the early 70s, Republicans were just as in favor of Roe versus Wade as Democrats. So, yeah. so even on that specific issue, we didn't have, have agreement. Ask the question 10 years earlier in the 1960s, which was the party of civil rights? You know, I mean, so so it's 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 hard to, to think about how these things track. So almost anything we come up as being the the real distinction is really hard, particularly when you when you also think about pre Civil War. Maybe not parties, but serious groups of people said, "We're not sure that we want to stay." So the New England secessionists in the eighteen teens and the eighteen twenties. Are, are they the are they the heirs of the Southerners who wanted to, or, or were they the forebears of the the ancestors of the Southerners who wanted to pull out, or were they two completely different groups of groups of people doing different things? So, you, you know, I, I think it's a fascinating question to ask. What were the issues at any particular time that divided the parties, and and then ask do those track? I'm, I'm not sure they do, even if at any particular time we could say the parties were doing different things, right? And, and, and of course, how we look at the parties and whether, for example, we look at the party's platforms, really interesting. 1948, civil rights plank in the Democratic Party. Good, bad, indifferent, how would Republicans look at that? Lots of really interesting historical questions to ask about political parties. And I do think it's fair to say that, that students need to be careful about this question for this reason. And I mean, they need to be really careful because depending on the generation of your judges, they're going to think differently about political parties and what their values are and what their problems are. So, so students need to be really careful with this question. And, and, you know, if they're going to take a position, they need to have some real some real support for it, and they may want to situate the argument in a particular time period, either the framing or right now. 
Well, are, but, are you referencing, I'm, I'm curious, Hank, are you referencing the fluctuation of, of party identification and party alignment and realignments as far as this generational notion? Is that what, you know, what you're referencing here? Yeah, it, and, and it, I yeah, understand. It, it, Go ahead. Let, let, let me put it this way. I, I think that a 60 year old judge will think about the distinctions between the Republican and Democratic Party differently than a 30 year old judge. And it may well lead to some confusion among those among those judges. So so my point is just don't be surprised if you see very different people. And frankly, even judges from different parts of the country may view the political parties question differently. If you situated in the 1790s and today, or the 1790s and 1860 and today, perfectly fine. But if you try to trace a path from the 1790s through yeah. the 2020s, you're going to have a tough time with some folks, exactly. and there may be some right. confusion. So that, that's 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 just my point on that one. Well, let's let's get rid of the labels: Republican, Democrat, Whig you know, whatever those labels, but the issues, all right, the principles and the issues to me, there is a constancy there. And again, I go back to, all right, who's going to decide, you know, state, federal, uh, uh, there, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to, to trade policy, you know, a, a whole range of things. And, and I don't know if, do we fixate on the labels? Well, a Republican in 1960 is completely different than a Republican in 1990 and now 2020. Is that what we should focus on? Or, you know, or is it the issues that lead to, at any given time, these parties in battle with each other? Do you understand what I'm saying? That is, is to me, the, the question focuses on the issues that leads to parties. And is there a constancy in those issues you seem to be focusing on the evolution of parties the, and how they identify themselves, the, the realignments that have been going on. And I don't know if that's the focus of the question. And I, again, I could be I could be really on base. Chris? So, David, are you are you posing that issues drive parties or parties drive issues? I, I'm going to make the argument that issues drive parties and it is contextual to generations and, and periods of time but issues, what led to the death of the Whig party? It was an issue. Am I correct there, Mr. Moore, as you're the expert on the death of the Whig party? It's not personality. <laughs> it, it's not personality. It's, it's, it's yes. the issue, uh, you know, of, of, you know, Northern Southern Whigs and the issue of slavery. Uh, well, right? it was a little more, than, it was a little more slavery, but that's what, that's what killed the Whig party. They tried to straddle the fence on that. But um, see, I, I actually agree with you, David, that I think uh, ideology drives parties because of uh, because there has been a kind of a rotating set of labels on political parties through our history. But some of those issues persist. Now, I, I would say for students, they might want to consider the issues showing up in various factions within the parties. I mean, th I mean, this is why, you know, when the Whig Party collapses, you immediately have like a dozen parties that pop up and many of them single issue parties uh, that were, you know, now they, now they don't have a big tent to be in anymore. So, so those issues pop up within factions if a party collapses, but those issues are there if the big tent is there as well. So students might want to consider wherever, to Hank's point, if they're going to plop themselves in a particular time frame look look deeply at the different ideas and in my estimation factions within the big tent at that time yeah i mean yeah. I, oh sorry go mike go, go ahead mike I, well i just think a federalist believed there should be a bank right so they believed in strong government power versus today a democrat would be, believe the federal government should do more to um to affect climate change, right? Pass more laws. If a student were to make the argument, yeah, it's the same issue, it's just about federalism. Look at the bank and look at the climate change. I, I'm gonna go to town poking holes in that. I mean, I, I don't see how you can, right. th that, that is, federalism is not, an. I don't see it as an issue. I see it as, 
I, I just don't see it that but way. But late. Yeah. Of, 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 Labor Democrats don't give a rat at the Lincoln Tap. They're the old traditional lunch bucket bread and butter Democrat. Yeah. So my point is, maybe within the Democratic Party, the climate change people are a particular faction. All, all, all of which may well be right, but but there are two issues that are are, are are really problematic in terms of thinking about how the, the the range works. One is race, because of course none of them cared about race back then, and the reason right. why race matters now is because of the expansion of voting. But the second is, I think a lot of people actually view the Democratic Party as being an urban party. It, it's it's right. not a question of north south; it's a question of urban rural. And I'm not sure that the Federalists were urban rural, Federalists and the Federalists were urban rural in the way that we're rural, in the way that we're urban rural now. Um, so, so, so I think there have been some demographic changes that make the parties necessarily reflective of their membership, but the memberships are so different now than they were before. I think it's worthwhile, however, for students to note these things and say, for example, the issues that led to the formation of the original political parties are not the same that they are now. And let me explain why. That to me is an answer that has more chance of being received well than one that tries to trace the issues from yes. the 1790s to today. Now I might be wrong because clearly if David's on the panel, he's going for the so what are the bank issues of 2020? But it seems to me that the rest of us are probably asking, how in the heck do we translate the bank issues into climate change? It's, but, called, but the the it's called the Federal Reserve and a major faction of the Republican Party being so opposed to Federal Reserve power and policy. You know? it, which, which in theory should matter if we cared about deficits, but neither party apparently cares about deficits anymore. You see, I mean, and, and I'm being deadly serious about that. The concept of deficit, I, I could trace deficits back to mercantilism versus agrarianism back in the 1790s a whole lot easier than I could trace anything else. The problem, of course, is that there are a whole lot of things that went on between 2020 and then. But now that neither party really cares that much about deficits, it's hard to really argue about what the Federal Reserve is doing. See, and I guess I guess what I'm trying to say, and, and you're absolutely right. If we're going to draw a, a, a chronology, uh, you know, over over you know 1790s to 2020, and we're going to talk about the bank, yeah, that's probably a lost cause. I guess I'm thinking more conceptually, uh, Hank, and that is, you know, to me, it's a question of who decides. So where the today's Democratic Party wants, for the most part generally wants highly centralized decision making, which again, the, the, the current, the Biden COVID relief plan has been at least advertised as a dream come true for progressives, right? Is that we're getting a lot of centralized economic decision making, redistribution of wealth to hopefully bring people out of poverty. To me, that's conceptually no different than the Federalists of the 1790s wanted the central bank once again to lead to you know, equ economic development, at least in Hamilton's mind, it would be equitable economic development uh, if you had a central bank. So I guess I'm okay. thinking, so, go ahead. So, so, so a student argues that I'm going to ask, so which party was against the GI Bill? Which party? Yeah, well, which party was against the GI Bill? I, because the GI Bill actually did a lot more of what you're talking about than anything else. So who well, was against the GI Bill? I love you, you, the two professors here at the institutions of higher you know, learning in the Ivory, you, you guys, you find these, these rare exceptions to the concept of was huge. Principle. Created a new class. What? Preach it, Chris. Preach it, was baby. A rare preach it. The GI Bill was huge. I'm not saying it's not huge, and I'm saying it's one example of which you have bipartisan consensus. All right. I, I, I'm, I'm listening to this. And I'm, 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 I, I'm trying to like, I'm going back to it's either John Patrick or John Kaminsky. And I don't know how many years ago, but saying the, federal, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists believed in the same things. 
they believed in the same things, fundamentally believed in the same things. They just thought there were different places to carry these things out or different, whether the states or the national government, right? So I think I would agree that that's there to a limit. There's no way in God's green earth you can trace to where we are today back to the feds, anti-feds. You just, you can't, you can't do that. There are too many, too many junctures on those switches. Um, but, you know, I think, and David, I would agree with you to a point, but, you know, you, so you make the argument about Democrats wanting a stronger central government to come in and fix, say, like climate change. But what about when the Republicans are in control of the national government? Do, do uh, they want the Republican uh, policy on immigration or do they want to maintain this concept of sanctuary cities? And they don't want the feds to come in and tell them what to do within their cities in terms of you know, uh, immigration enforcement. So I, I just think that, you know, I think that I think the fundamental argument is still true. People kind of want the same things to a degree, qualify that to a degree, they just think there are different places where this best reflects what they want, whether it be well, my town hall, whether it be the state state house, or is it in Washington? And 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 again, obviously the question is far more nuanced because it starts off to what extent. And I don't think that that I don't know if I suggest to students to make the argument none to no extent is there uh, any you know consistency or persistence. Of these issues. So the students have to be fairly nuanced in talking about this because that's what a to what extent is asking them to do. Uh, I don't think it's all or nothing in this. I do think there's connective tissue there, Chris. Oh, uh, I, 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 I very much do. And I'm they've, got with to be, that. they've got to make a fairly good argument, a fairly sophisticated argument to connect, make those connections. And, and, you know, they, they, they don't need to be as simplistic as I am uh, and obviously, you know, dish on the, uh, the GI Bill uh, uh, kind of thing. But, you know, I do think that there is a connective tissue there throughout our history. I agree. I agree. Because I think people are, are, are relatively, I don't want to say the same. I think issues have changed, but people still, you know, the, uh, those basic needs, right, um, I still wonder, I'm going to go back to my original question to you, David, was that do, do, do parties drive issues or do issues drive parties? And part of me likes to think today, and this is my cynical view, that parties are driving issues. Because if you go back to Mike's comment earlier in 2016, what do people care about? They cared about what, Mike, what, what are the three things you listed, right? Abortion, the court, and getting rid of health care. Why do those people believe that? Is that because that's what they've been told? This no, that's a ground. That's a grassroots movement. Hank said it earlier. You go back to 1970. All right. Uh, the, both the Republican Democratic Party have factions within them that don't have a problem with with Roe versus Wade. In fact, support it. There, the, the, my point is, my point is, David, that those aren't grassroots movements. Those are astroturf movements funded by special interests. Absolutely funded by special interests. I agree. There's some, there's some of those. I, abortion, I don't agree, is 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 a, is a is an astroturf uh, issue. There, the Republican Party chose to adopt that because that's where they saw their you know either cynically or not. That's where they saw their a, a political uh, power base uh, forming, and and they went down that road. They didn't have to choose that, and that's what's led to the purge of moderate Republicans. Right. Well, they're in party driving the issue. That's my point. Party drive. No, the voters drove the party to make that decision. All right. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's how they, I don't know. Professor William, you're the political scientist. Clear this up for us. <laughs> Clear well, this up for us? Mike, Mike before, you, before you go, Mike, I mean, hey, students, look up, a, look up a paper by two uh, guys. One's Princeton, one's Northwestern. They are political scientists. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, Page and Gillens are their names. And it's a it's a party it's a paper about uh, the United States moving toward oligarchy. So you might want to check that out because there it's a it's a pretty worthwhile read. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, my the first anecdote I gave was that in 2016 when you asked Republican voters what issue they cared about, they cared about who was going to get nominated to the Supreme Court. Remember, remember Mitch McConnell had held that it became a referendum. Mitch McConnell says, "Let's let the next next justice decide, next president decide." Let the people decide 
who can be the next Supreme Court justice? It was a huge issue for a lot of people who supported Trump, right? Because they wanted that, that. so that's the first one. The second one about these Obamacare, gay rights and abortion, actually the public opinion polls, each of those issues, over 65% of Americans support Obamacare, right? Support not overturning Roe v. Wade, and, um, and what was the third one? And support gay marriage, right? But the Republican platform was one that was saying we wanted to overturn those. So I think the, the point I was trying to make was with that was that the Republican Party and the people, I don't even know where I'm going now. I can't clean this up. I just, <laughs> I just, I just, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. So, Mike, what do you think? Do parties drive the issue or issue drive the parties? You know, political scientists, it's both. It's all, it's all both. It's all both. <laughs> so, so, so let me let me throw one extra piece of the puzzle here when we talk about who decides what or where, where it goes. Because, again, as folks know, I'm kind of a structuralist. The difficulty I have with that concept is think about the New England town hall meeting. It, it, it's just not the case that folks think that issues should be decided at X level or Y level. It's which issues should be decided at one, one level or the other. And that has as much to do with what people think the Constitution requires and what it doesn't require. So in New England, you can have lots of people, whether they're on the left or on the right, throughout history saying, we ought to decide local issues locally. Well, that's also what they're saying in the South. Right. So, so, so it's not it's not really a where the issues are decided. It's where you think the Constitution tells you the issues are supposed to be decided. And on that issue, the parties are a little separate, but I'm not sure that they're all that separate in 17 in the 1790s or even largely speaking through the 1980s. Right? It's, it's only very recently that we've sort of and, and still it's only sort of sort of decided that we want to, well, in fact, I'm not even sure we've decided that. I think both parties right now are national parties. Both of them want things decided at the national level. They just want them decided at whatever level they think will allow them to win. So yeah, it doesn't surprise me that Republicans cared about the Supreme Court because they figured, well, we can win on the national grounds if we win the Supreme Court. Not that the Supreme Court was necessarily gonna turn all issues to states because it's not clear to me that a lot of Republicans want California to do what it wants to do on immigration, or that it wants to allow California to do what it wants to do on abortion. No, they'd rather have a national rule on abortion. They just aren't sure whether it'll be allowed. But I don't think they're actually sitting around saying, we want states to make this determination. No, they want to be able to make, they want all states to make the same determination. And my guess is they would live with a national rule if they could get it. But Short of that, sure, we'll let states decide. And I'm not sure that's something that's been consistent through the last couple hundred years, although I'm certainly happy to, to have, have more discussion about it. So uh, Tim and Chris, and I don't, you know, maybe Mike, uh, you guys taught, you know, something to the equivalent of AP Gov, I imagine, in your career. There was a, there was a, a, a reader that was very, very popular and high school AP government. I think it's Wall, W-O-L-L. -L. It's an anthology. Yeah. Of, and in there on parties, they had the question of divided government. And, and the article, and I can't remember the author of that specific article, but he, he argued that divided, divided government was actually better uh, for, uh, you know, uh, for Americans, that it was uh, much more, not, not necessarily efficient, but it ended up with better legislation. Uh, do, I don't know if you remember that article it's, uh, uh, it's, from that reader. Do you, it's David do you, Mayhew's argument, I think. What's that? I think it's Mayhew. David Mayhew's argument. That's the, right. So, well, Professor Williams, you do you agree with that? Do I agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, I think the I mean the evidence bears it out, and that even the last since 1969. There have been, you know, 27, like two year governments, 19 of those have been divided. And if we look even from then up to now, 
most legislation that gets passed is bipartisan, right? Or it doesn't get passed at all. And a lot of that's because the filibuster makes it really, really difficult to get things done while you have, just by just trying to get a couple votes here and there. So I think to go to Hank's point about the structure, the way Congress has structured itself now, you do see, um, you do see legislation passing in divided government. And frankly, since the 1969, we haven't seen that many periods of unified government for it to actually work that, to get the empirical cases. And when we've had unified government, the parties show themselves to be what they are, what Chris has been saying. They're just a bunch of factions and they can't agree on something. So usually they, they can't get what they want done. And the students, to clarify, divided government, traditionally the sense is that, that one party controls the White House and another party controls Congress. But we know that those, we've talked about this on numerous broadcasts, those institutional jealousies that the founders hoped it would prevail have given way to party, party politics. So that there's no longer ambition being made to counteract ambition, but the divided government being the president is of one party and the, and the Congress is of another, right? That's what you're alluding to, right, David? Yeah, that, that's it. And I, I'm curious, Mike, does that research hold up in the last two administrations, Obama through, uh, through Trump? Yeah, in terms of what passes Congress? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for something, the success of, of, of passing, um, yeah, it does. But, that, but I think, Mike, that, doesn't that speak to the fact of the, um, the monkey wrench that the filibuster throws into things? Yeah. Because even though you have those small windows of period, like Obama had a small window where they controlled everything, uh, Trump had a small window where they controlled everything, right. and still very little happened other than, oh, I don't know, tax cuts for the 1%. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, yeah, those people that are so concerned about the deficit now, but I'll leave that where that is. Um, so the idea, the idea of the filibuster is really the issue there that, that throws a monkey wrench, even when both parties control everything. Yeah, I think about, I think about the, the Obama years, Mike. I mean, the, the history that's going to be written is, you know, not going to be a pleasant look at, especially, you know, at, at, at the Senate's role. Yeah, he gets, he gets the Affordable Care Act, but that's when he's got unified government. All right, after, after they lose the Senate, does he get any p major piece of legislation through? Here's, here's the way I should, I'm sorry, I'm getting tired. The way I should have articulated this is that when there has been divided government from 1985 to 2018, right, 51% of the bills offered to Congress have passed. And when there's been unified government, it's been 57%. So in terms of can, 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 can you pass legislation in divided government, it's about, it's about the same. It's not like you see unified government and you see a bunch of bills um, pass more frequently. That, that's what I was trying to get at. I think I misspoke and said bipartisan. I didn't mean to say that. It's just that's Zoom fatigue. Students. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Chambers, we're going to let you have the last word. Any thoughts on unified uh, uh, versus divided government? Yeah, the, the one piece that we don't tend to look at is the dog that doesn't bark. So what kinds of things do we simply never get past that we should have gotten past because we just can't come together, whether it's unified or divided, to be perfectly honest, right? What problems have we not solved that we should have solved that we can't solve because of whether it's the filibuster and the way it's been used or what have you? And, and, and here, I will take this last opportunity to remind students, you want to be careful about things. We talk about the filibuster as though it's something new. Filibuster has been around for a long time. How it's been used has changed over time. Historically, you could actually pass things 55-45 in the Senate. What has happened, however, is the way the filibuster is being used now, it is essentially being used to require 60 votes on things. That's not how it's always been. So just to note, when we talk about, uh, about filibuster, it's not just about the existence, it's about how it's being used. And that actually has a real effect on what we think of as divided government and non-divided government. Because I suspect that there were a number of times when 
you didn't have a filibuster proof majority in the Senate, but we still considered it to be controlled by the party that controlled more votes. So there are a couple things going on there. Um, but this, this is going to be a fun season. It's going to be a fun final season. And I hope, hope you all have a good time preparing for it. Well, that's a good way to end. Thank you, uh, uh, Hank. Uh, we appreciate you joining us in our, I guess we call them, uh, you know, free flow discussions. Uh, I've, I've personally missed uh, hanging around, uh, you know, a few days every summer. Uh, who knows? Uh, my understanding is earmarks are back. And so, hey, maybe the center has a chance to, to uh, come back to life there. Students, teachers, thank you very much. Uh, right now, I don't know what the next session is going to be about. Uh, we're going to talk about that later, but we'll see you in a few. Uh, until then, peace, love, yogurt, tacos. Bye, 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 bonds.